22. Psalm 22. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, and in the night season, and am not silent. But thou art holy, O thou, inhabitest, o thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee, they trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee, and were delivered. They trusted in thee, and were not confounded. I am, war I am a worm, and am no man, a reproach of men, and despise the people. All they that see me, all they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip, and they shake the head, saying, He trusted in the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breasts. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me. For trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have compassed me, strong bulls of Bashan have beset me. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a, ro as a raving and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. Thou hast, thou hast brought me into the dust of death, for the dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet, that I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. They part my garments upon them, among them, and cast lots upon my vesture. Be not far, be not far, be not thou far from me, O Lord. O my strength, haste thee to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation will I pray. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. Ye that fear the Lord, praise him. All ye the seed of Jacob, glorify him. <coughs> And fear him, all ye seed, all ye the seed of Israel. For he had not despised nor abhorred the afflicted of the afflicted, the affliction of the afflicted. Neither hath he hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard. But when he cried unto him, he heard. My praise shall be of thee, in the great in the. In the great congregation, I will pay my vows before them that fear him. The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn unto the Lord. And all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before him. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he is the governor among the nations. All they that be all they that be fat upon, among upon the earth shall eat and worship. All they 
that go down to the dust shall bow before him, and none shall keep alive his own soul. A seed shall serve him, it shall be accounted to the Lord for a debt for a generation. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born that he hath done this. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, our Brother Young bringing the message. And help us to learn something for, from thy word. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Amen. Thank you, David. <clears throat> to the chief magician upon Ajla Shanar, a psalm of David. Well, those two foreign sounding words there are uh, translated deer of the dawn or, or hind of the dawn. It's basically... Uh, as best as most people can figure is that this psalm is supposed to be sung in according to this fami other familiar tune which is called the deer of the dawn which means basically that uh, it's something that happens right before the morning it, it uh, it's kind of like when the deers wake up when the you know just kind of like when the hunters go out and they're about ready to uh, go and and look for the deer because they're just finally looking for food and they're out before the dawn and they they're ready to go and <clears throat> the deer of the dawn is kind of like when th it's right before dawn and you know how they say it sometimes it's the darkest before dawn or or it's kind of like a similar phrase to that where the idea is with this either this tune or this theme is that uh, the victory is not yet won and it seems really dark and we're not sure what's going to happen and if we feel like there is no light there is no it's it's like it's kind of like how you feel when you're exhausted and you you think maybe that the the thing's almost over but you you don't know it could continue on you don't know if you have enough strength to go on uh it's kind of like just before the morning just before uh when things seem darkest when you're not sure what's going on you're not sure if you'll win the battle or you'll lose the battle uh that is kind of the idea of the deer of the dawn it is kind of like uh it is things that happen before it actually gets light, things that are before it's finally completed. And you can see, kind of see that general stress in this psalm where uh, it starts out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It feels You feel like that you, you know, especially the last two psalms that we read, Psalm chapter 20, it is basically, it's before the battle, it's before anything happens. They know that God's going to win the battle. They know that uh, they can celebrate before the battle is even started, that God's going to give them victory. And then Psalm 21 is kind of like the psalm after the battle. It's like, yeah, God gave the victory. Yeah, that's awesome. It's amazing. Uh, God gave us the victory to win over our enemies. And this is the proof of it. This we, we celebrate beforehand, and now we're celebrating after because God has given the victory. But Psalm 22 is in the midst of the battle when you think everything's going against you, when you think that it's not going to work out. You, uh, you're in the middle of the battle. You're not sure whether you're going to win or you're going to lose. And in fact, you feel like you're going to lose. You feel like nobody is for you. You feel like everybody is against you. And then you, in exhaustion, you just cry out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I feel like I'm all alone in this. I feel like I cannot persevere. I feel like the, the evil people around me are persevering over me. I feel, like, uh, I feel like this battle will not be won by me or by you. And you said you would be with me. We, we celebrated before the battle. And, and I'm not sure what's going to happen because we're in the midst of the battle and they seem stronger than me. Uh, these people seem like bulls, they seem like dogs, they seem like uh, aggressive animals that, that I can't persevere against and I feel like everything in my being, being so exhausted and just, I, I don't think that I have anything to win over them because there's nobody on my side, I'm all alone. And of course, we understand Psalm 22 to be prophetically about Jesus Christ. We can basically go through this whole psalm and we can see Jesus in this psalm while he is suffering on the cross of Calvary. We can see Jesus saying, saying these same words. And in fact, in, uh, in Psalm, probably Matthew chapter 27, you can look at there and you can see where he says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me while he's on the cross? 
Now, uh, the, here's, here's a problem with some theologians and th some people today is that they'll see my God, they'll see God, Jesus Christ in the flesh, uh, being who is God in the flesh, on the cross, and then th when they hear him say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, they'll make up on the spot. Well, maybe God, maybe he thinks that God has forsaken him. Maybe he thinks that, uh, that he thought that God was real, but when he's on the cross in the moment of his agony, he's thinking that God's not real. Uh, he's thinking that all these things, and they're thinking that God, Jesus Christ, is doubting the existence of God, or he's doubting uh, the loving favor of God on his life. And that is the the problem with that thought is the the idea is that a lot of times when people see a, a quote or or something written by by God in the New Testament, they think, oh well, and then they make up their own assumption about what he says. But the thing is, when, when Jesus says on the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He's not, he's not in distress and saying, Oh, I, didn't know, I thought I was God, now I made a mistake. Oops! You know, I, I didn't really mean to go to the cross. I didn't really mean to do all this stuff. I thought I was really God, but now, now that I got this moment of clarity, I think that uh, God's forsaken me, that God doesn't really care about me. No, that's not what he's thinking on the cross. What he wants, uh, what he's doing is that when he's declaring anything that he declares on the cross, he's alluding back to something in the Psalms. And so when he says, well, just think about it. When you're on the cross and you can't really breathe and you're trying to uh, get the people who are around you to understand something, you get them to understand so that when they look back and they remember what you cried out on the cross, then you can look back in the Old Testament. Because remember, he is quoting from the Old Testament. It's kind of like when we will say, uh, all things work work uh, for good for them that trust in the Lord. You know, we're, we're, we're referring back to a song. We're refer referring back to our scriptures. We're not just saying something out of the blue. And, and that's a lot people a lot of times in, in treat the New Testament quotes. When, when the Bible says something in the New Testament, they automatically say, put their own thoughts into it, their own ideas into it. But we need to understand that the New Testament is based on the Old Testament. Everything that is written in the New Testament has its foundation in the Old Testament. Yes, granted, there is new revelation in the sense that we now understand what the psalmist was talking about. We now understand what the Old Testament prophets were talking about. But the New Testament does not exist in a vacuum to where we put our own spin on things, where we make up our own thoughts about why he called out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because when God says something, or when Jesus says something, or uh, wherever it is in the New Testament, when he gives a teaching, you can find that teaching uh, clearly in the Old Testament. Uh, what Jesus does is not, is not make something <coughs> new. He teaches us something that was already there, but then he gives us the correct interpretation or the correct understanding of that passage, whereas in the Old Testament, uh, it's, he's not making something up new that never existed before, but he is giving us a principle that everything in the New Testament has its foundation in the Old Testament. That's why when he's walking to the road to Emmaus and these people are like, well, haven't you heard what happened in Jerusalem? And they're making up their own stuff. They're, they can't figure out what's happening. And then he revealed to them by opening up the scriptures uh, from Moses and all the way down as they're walking on, he's showing every passage of Old Testament scripture and saying, hey, this stuff was foretold of old. You guys should already understand this stuff. Your problem is that the, not that you don't have the scriptures, but that you've been taught wrong, or you've, uh, or you put your own spin on things, and so Psalm 22, and, and also when when Christ calls out on the cross, "My God, My God, why hast thou forsaken me?" He wants us to. Uh, he's not implying, that, and the New Testament is not implying that God has somehow um, forsaken His Son on the cross. What he's uh, what he's implying is that He wants us at that moment in time while He's hanging on the cross to understand Psalm chapter 22. And because he's he's on the cross and he can't breathe very well, uh, it's not like he's going to be quoting the whole passage. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like, uh, it's, it's kind of like, uh, uh, it's basically, if probably if he was able to breathe quite well, he would probably be quoting the whole thing. Uh, but he wants, he's alluding to Psalm 22 by just quoting the very first line, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because he wants people, when they look back on the cross, to 
realize this is what's going through his mind. The whole psalm is going through his mind, not just the first few lines and feeling forsaken by God, but rather also the last part of this chapter where he, he actually says, even while he's still on the cross, I'm winning the victory. I know what's going to happen. Even though I don't understand this feeling I'm feeling on the cross, feeling forsaken, I actually know that God is with me. I, and then this psalm kind of shows us how that even though we sometimes feel forsaken by God, that God has not forsaken us. Uh, and, and we'll notice this in, in, the pa in the passage here, especially in, in regards to, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? If you look in several different passages, you'll notice uh, the Bible says in, uh, of course, that's quoted in Matthew chapter 27, verse 46, is he asked that question uh, on the cross, why hast thou forsaken me? Uh, but then 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So we understand that there's a process going on to where there's a transference of his righteousness being shed abroad onto us. Uh, it's being bruised out of him. It's been uh, just like when in the Old Testament where it says that you got to bring oil beaten for the lamps. So too is he being beaten for us. He's uh, shedding forth the oil of the Holy Ghost out of himself onto us. And that is what's happening is that he is... Uh, he is being made sin for us. You know, of course, we know that sin is not a material thing. But in this sense, all the sin, all the anger that God has against people for transgressing his law is placed upon Jesus. And all that righteousness, all that holiness that God, that Jesus Christ has done is being transferred onto us through his blood, through the shedding of his blood, through the offering of, of his blood through the whole world. We, be, we are being restored to God. Uh, and Isaiah chapter 53 verse 10 says it pleased the Lord to bruise him so we understand that that he feels this way because he's going through a process he feel there's a transference happening just like when somebody's a wicked sinner and then God doesn't hear that wicked sinner because of their wickedness and because they're rebelling against him and he stands against them so too now that all that sin has been transferred unto Jesus Christ on the cross Jesus Christ is going to feel that same uh, exclusion, that feeling of absence of God for uh, all the sin in the world. And also, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19 says, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. So this idea that God has forsaken Jesus, uh, the idea that, oh, uh, God is not, no longer with Jesus, it is a mistaken idea in the Bible because the Bible clearly says that even though the Jesus perhaps on the cross as as humanity as a man of God uh, as somebody who is facing all the wrath of God on it in himself he feels that way he feels forsaken just like Job in the midst of his tribulation feels forsaken by God but then we find even in the life of Job, even though he feels forsaken by God, God is always there watching the whole situation. And, and so just as Job feels forsaken by God and he could cry out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? God never forsook Job. And so the same too, while Jesus Christ was on the cross, he never, while he feels this way, he, he, I, I don't doubt that Jesus felt forsaken. He felt that way. Uh, that's not the mistake, but the mistake is thinking that God actually forsook him. He didn't forsake him because, uh, like I said, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19 says, God was in Christ. Uh, the Father is in Jesus Christ, and God himself, the Trinity, the, the, the Godhead, is all in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. So the Holy Ghost is in Christ, the, the, the Father is in Christ, the, uh, the Son is in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. Through the death of Jesus Christ, uh, the whole world is reconciled back to God in its fullness. Uh, we understand that uh, Christ, because of the wicked sins of the world, has cut himself off voluntarily, not because he's not able to speak with us, but because he does not want to look upon sin, because he doesn't want to see these things, that he has uh, put a veil between us and himself, but through the flesh of Jesus' blood, we are able to be reconciled back to God in his fullness. Because uh, Jesus Christ, God in his humanity, uh, could walk among men even before his uh, crucifixion, but then when Christ is crucified on the cross, he, we don't just 
see God the Son, but we also are reconciled back to God the Father, and then the Holy Ghost through Jesus Christ is shed upon the whole world uh, so that all people can receive him uh, if they only ask, if they allow him to come and enter into his, their life, they can be reconciled back to God through the Spirit. So we see and understand that while he felt this way, he was not actually literally forsaken by God. And so, so we need to understand and apply this to our own life that when we're going through trials, we're going through situations where we feel like calling out and crying and saying, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? then we need to realize and understand that even though we don't understand the feelings we're going through, even though we feel that we're being rejected by God, just like Job, just like Jesus Christ, just like David in this psalm, uh, we need to understand that God has not forsaken you. Uh, if you're saved, He is not forsaking you. If you're in sin, He may be uh, reprimanding you, He may be correcting you, but He has not forsaken you. Because remember and understand, especially this time and day and age, we have the Holy Ghost within us, even though we sin, even though he has to correct us, even though we, or sometimes we go through testing and trials, God is still with us. He is, he is reconciling us with him, and these trials are to make us more holy. They're, they're, they're there for a purpose. So he says in verse 2, Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, and in the night season, and am not silent. And so you see, you see here that while he is feeling forsaken by God, he has not forsaken God. He's crying out to God. He's pleading for the presence of God. Remember when Job uh, felt forsaken by God, he was calling out for the presence of God. So oftentimes, that we, uh, it's, not the, it's not the trial that causes us great pain as Christians. It's feeling forsaken that causes great pain as Christians because when we have the power of God in our lives and we, we know that God is with us, the greatest obstacle, the greatest thing that is against us, we feel like we can overcome quite easily. We can charge hell with a squirt gun when we know that Jesus Christ is with us. We know we're doing the will of God and we see things happening in accordance to the will of God and we see victory, then we can praise the Lord as in a Psalm 20 or a Psalm 21. But when we're going through the trial and we're going through the process that God is fulfilling His will through us and in us, but we can't see the end result, we can't see what's going on, and we feel like we're being opposed and we're being uh, we're being overcome by the world or, or overcome by the adversaries of of Christ, then we don't understand what's going on. We cry out for, for power from heaven. We cry out for, for uh, the ability for God to show His power strong through us, and then all we see is silence. All we hear is silence and nothing's going on. We, we, we're doing the will of God. We're, we're trying to, we're suffering for Christ. We're, we're being obedient children, and yet we feel like there's no power. We feel like God's not working. In fact, we understand that when God, when Jesus Christ called out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? We understand after the fact, and, and Paul reveals to us after the fact, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. So even though, even Christ felt like nothing's happening, nothing's going on, and David, when he was going through his trial, and, and Job, when he was going through his trial, he felt nothing's going on. In fact, God was using that situation to reconcile somebody and something to himself. He was using David to bring a kingdom together. He was using Job to, uh, to reveal to his friends their theology was not quite right. He was, using, uh, he was using the cross of Christ, even though it seems like nothing's going on and that people are mocking around him. He's using the cross of Christ to bring the world back to himself. So we need to understand when we're going through trials and situations, we're trying to fulfill the word of God, we're trying to be obedient to the Lord, and we don't see anything happening. We need to understand that even if we don't feel it and we don't see it and we can't observe it, that doesn't mean that God's not working. It just means that we can't see it at the time. We just need to remain faithful. We need just to continue to go through. And then God in, in due course will show and reveal to us how he was using that situation later on. And so he says, he says, uh, I'm calling out to you and I'm not remaining silent. I'm still being faithful. So, so that's the other point is that in, this, in these situations, these darkest hours, we need to realize, hey, we need to remain faithful to God because we don't know what's going on, but God does. God knows what's going on. 
Uh, verse 3, But thou art holy, thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee, they trusted in thee, and thou didst deliver them. So when he's struggling to understand what's going on, he goes back to what has happened in the past. He, he goes back to the things that God has already done. And then he starts calling out to God, I don't know why you're not fulfilling things in my life. I don't know what's going on in my life. But I know you did all these things for God. Uh, or, or you did all these things for our fathers. You did all these things for other people. Uh, you so, I've seen your hand mighty in the work of other churches that caused, you know, they were in situations like ours, and then they persevered. I don't know why we're not persevering, but because they did, I want to I want to call upon you for the same thing that happened in their in their situation to happen in our situation. He, he's he's uh, looking back to them. They cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. He's like, they got the victory. Why am I not getting the victory? And then he, and then we see again uh, the feelings of perhaps maybe there's something wrong with me. How often times do we think that when we're going through trials of life that we're not getting the victory because maybe there's something wrong with me? You know, see, he says, but I'm a worm and no man. See, he's... He's kind of lowering himself. He's making himself less than uh, he ought to be. He's like, God, the reproach of men and the despised of the people. It's like, God answers the prayers of men. God answers the prayers of other people. But I'm insignificant. He's not paying attention to me. Uh, he's not doing the things that I really want or I really need. He, he's ignoring my situation. You know, he, he saw their situation. See how, how it's kind of like that double feeling of... Uh, there's a comfort in the fact that he did this for other people but then so often times even though we know he did it for other people we feel like we're not worthy of what he did for other people we're just a worm we're something less than a man uh, the worm is basically when you are dead you know not to be gruesome but basically when you are dead and you're being eaten of worms you know just just as job says uh when i basically when he's in the grave uh though the worms this body destroy yet will i stand on the earth and see my see the lord uh it's the same situation as he's saying but i'm a worm i'm so dead that the only thing that's alive in me are those worms crawling around quite literally is what he's saying there those things that are eating my carcass those things that are eating my body that's who i am because that's the only life left in me uh, that's quite literally what he's saying there. I'm a worm. I'm not a man. Uh, anything that resembled a man is basically gone now. And we can kind of see the semblance of the whole process that Jesus went through to get to the cross and the whole process of live, being on that cross. You, feel, you can see how, how he could almost feel, or we can almost feel that he felt, uh, that he was less than a man. He, he, he was God in heaven, equal with God, and yet he humbled himself, become a servant, and then now he subjected himself to the cross, and now he's less than even men themselves. He's not even equal with a man, he's less than a man. All that see me laugh me to scorn, they shoot out the lip and shake their heads, saying, he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him, yet let him deliver him seeing he delighteth in him we we see this passage <clears throat> in the cross in, in the picture of the cross as well we remember uh when when christ was on that cross he was hanging on that cross in matthew chapter 27 uh and uh i think it was ba verse 43 uh, we see that the pharisees and and those who were against him made a mockery uh, he says he, he could heal others, but he can't heal himself. He, he, he could rescue others. Let him rescue him. Let, let God rescue him. If he be the Son of God, let him uh, let God rescue him. Let him be taken off of that cross. Just as it says, He cried out in the ninth hour. Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me some of them that stood there when they heard that they said this man calleth out for Elias and they took a sponge and all this stuff and it says uh, but in verse 43 uh, we see this thing as well he trusted in God let him deliver him now if he will have him for he said I am the son of God and so we can see 
And also, uh, verse 42, He saved others himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. See, uh, that is kind of where Jesus is feeling at the moment. And, and ironically, just as Jesus is the, the one who feels forsaken in this passage, so too we can see those, uh, those people who are against God, against Jesus Christ, against the, the true king of Israel, uh, they're quite literally quoting in ignorance verse 8. They are quoting in ignorance. He trusted in the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighteth in him. And, and, and so we can see how, the, how, the, the, how Matthew is quoting quite literally during the trial period, Psalm 22. In fact, uh, every other verse could quite literally be uh, transferred over to Matthew chapter 27. And you can see the applications in that in the suffering of Jesus on the cross and so also in, in like manner the the wickedness of the people that put him on the cross <coughs> and then and then we see the situation it's he's uh, they're mocking him they're using his and so oftentimes too is we proclaim the power of Jesus Christ before uh, you know the power of God before a situation and a trial but then we're going through the trial how often times do the wicked come around and they mock? Ha ha, you believed in God. Let, let God deliver you from this. Let's see how God's going to deliver you from that. And, and you don't see deliverance and they're making a mockery. And you feel like, God, if, if they continue to mock, then it's going to look like you're doing nothing and that you're not real. So often times people mock and say, look, God strike me dead if he's real. Oh, he didn't strike me dead. So ha ha ha, look at that. And they make a mock of God. They make a mock of the things of God and we feel like I don't know what to do in this situation because it seems like God is being mocked and, and I can't do anything. He says here and, and I was cast but but then here here's the thing again. Remember he he he's struggling to find something. He's tr struggling to find something to grasp onto to continue to trust in God. You see, even though we don't know what's going on and we're not sure what's going on, uh, the true the true child of God searches for things to, to grasp a hold of. I know what you did in the past and, and he's fleetingly trying to hold on to that but then the thought comes to his mind but I'm just a worm. He's not going to do that like he did to the fathers. And then and then he tries to grasp on something else. But thou art who t he that took me out of the womb thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. And so now he's, he remembers what he did for his fathers. Now he remembers who he is as a child of God. Where Jesus Christ is the holy thing from God. He, the Holy Ghost came upon Mary and, and then overshadowed her. And then that holy thing that was born of her was Jesus Christ. And, and, and Jesus knows that he was cast upon God from the womb. Not, not, before, not, not at birth, but from the womb. From conception, from from before he was born, I was cast upon thee from the womb, thou art my God, from my mother's belly. And even the children of Israel can quite literally say the same thing, because what happened in their life? They, they the eighth day from birth, are circumcised and told that from a very early age that they belong to God, that they're servants of God. So whether they accept Jesus Christ as their Savior or not, they're raised in this situation from that from quite literally from eight days from birth, they are taught and they are circumcised to the fact that, hey, you need to believe in God. Hey, you need to trust in God. You are a child of God. You 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 are part of a nation of God. And so they are quite literally raised from birth. Uh, all the way to the moment of faith in learning the law of God and learn and then being taught the law of God being that having that schoolmaster there you now just as that psalm says that the wicked uh, from birth are born create uh, speaking lies why because the wicked teach their children uh, to live wickedly uh, they quite literally from birth uh, just as, as a child of Israel is quite literally thrown and thrust upon God as part of their culture, so too the wicked are quite literally throwing their children to the devil. They're quite literally throwing their children into sin. They're quite literally throwing them into a culture of wickedness. 
And, and so that's why it just says, as an Israelite can cry out, uh, I've been cast upon God. And then so too, the psalmist can also say that uh, I've been cast upon sin. I've been cast out into sin because of, because of my sin nature and because of all these things. As both can be true. Even though they as a family, are ca as a people, are cast upon God from birth, and quite even more literally of Jesus Christ, him being overshadowed by God from his conception, being born of God from the womb, being ca him, uh, the flesh of Jesus, uh, in having the Spirit of God, quite literally the Word of God dwelling within his body and, and giving him life, can quite literally say, I was from the womb. Uh, basically, he trusted on the Lord that would deliver him, let him. Uh, in verse 9 uh, thou didst make me the hope when I was upon my mother's breast I was cast upon thee from the womb thou art my God from my mother's belly he can quite literally say that Jesus is his God uh, God is his God from his mother's belly from from the earliest times of his existence as a human being he was one with God and, and, and to so he's pulling upon that he, he even though he can he's saying my God my God why hast thou forsaken me he draws upon the fact that he, in fact, is quite literally born of God. He, he's looking at his birth. And so, too, when we as Christians don't know what's going on in our life, don't know what's happening, we need to draw upon what he did for other Christians in the past, and then we need to draw upon the fact that we have the Holy Ghost within us, and then from, from our salvation, we are quite literally crying out, Abba, Father, we from our salvation are, are born of God. When we have that conversion, when we when the when the Holy Ghost comes within us and we cry, Abba Father, and it quickens our spirit, we are quite literally born again. We are quite literally from our birth in faith, thrust upon God. We we can quite literally say this in, in our spirit that we were cast upon thee from the womb, from our birth spiritually. Thou art my God, and from my mother's belly, from, from the time before I was saved, before I con was conceived of the Holy Ghost spiritually, uh, when I heard the gospel message, I became your child. Before my conception, before my birth, uh, before those things that caused salvation to enter in, I heard the word of the Lord, and... I and that spirit came in and I declared your name, Abba, Father. And, and so because I'm your child, be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. I can't trust in anybody else. Everybody else has forsaken me. Jesus, quite literally, there's no one else. J Judas betrayed him. Peter betrayed him. Uh, all the disciples fled. There is nobody else around that he can trust in. It is only God that he can trust in. There will be times in your life that you feel you're forsaken. You feel that you can't rely on anybody else. And the only person that is left is God. But then even God seems absent. And you're drawing on this fact of your salvation. Hey, you, you felt it worthy to save me. Help me from this trouble as well. And, and so he's grasping at things that God has done for him and, and things that he's done, done for others. And then he is holding on to his faith. We can see this in the life of Job, the patience of Job, and, and holding on to his faith even though everybody's forsaken him, and that even his closest friends are wagging their head. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him. You, you're, you're, you're not doing what's right. Uh, you need to turn back to God, and then maybe God will stop being mad at you. You see how the doubts and things arose in Job's life, in, and even Jesus on the cross, and even in our own lives. They gaped upon me with their mouths as ra ravaging and roaring lion. I am poured out like water. He, he's now explaining how he feels at that moment. You, you need to realize that when you're going through a trial, you're going through a situation, you shouldn't just try to bottle it up and hide it. You, you know how oftentimes people try to put things under underneath and hide it away. Oh, nothing's happening. I'm having a wonderful life. I'm so ultra spiritual. I have the joy of the Lord. I have all these wonderful things going on in my life. And, and you're inside, you're just torn up. You, you're, you're in pain. You're in agony. and you're you, But you're also in denial. Don't hide that stuff. Don't try to hide it even from God. Uh, uh, just let it out. Let, it, let, it, let God know how you feel. Here, he's like... 
I, as a Christian, uh, want to have your presence. I want you to be near me. I have all these bulls come, come passing me about. Uh, I feel like I'm going to be sh torn to shreds by their horns. They gape upon me with their mouths as, as ravaging, roaring lion. No, everybody's against me. I'm, I'm poured out like water. My bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. Quite literally, when uh, they, they, a lot of people believe that Jesus' heart quite literally melted. You know, when, when the centurion stabbed him in the heart, what came out was water and blood. And it's quite literally that his heart broke. It, it was melted in the midst of my bowels. It came up from the bow, through the bowels, uh, through the side of his uh, of his body, all the way up to his heart, and and gush forth water and blood. So too symbolizing this verse uh, that my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. See, when he's hanging on the cross by his joints and pop, his arms popping out because he can't hang on that cross anymore and he doesn't know what's going on and his strength is dried up he has no more strength of his own to to continue on the cross in faithfulness uh, in his own strength and my jaws and my tongue cleaveth unto my jaws and hast brought me into the dust of death he can't breathe he everything's out of joint his heart is broken uh, he's in pain and he's so thirsty he cannot bear it for dogs have compassed me the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me they pierced my hands and my feet. You see, the generation of vipers, those evil, wicked people uh, that rejected the Lord, have compassed him. Now, when the Bible talks about dogs, it's quite literally talking about people who have no spirit within them. They, they, they quite literally, a dog is a picture of an animal that has no spirit or, or no, no spirit consciousness, if you want to say that. Uh, they've completely cut themselves off from the spirit there is no spirit within them uh, in regards to the Lord all they desire if you if you understand a dog his desire is to be good or bad is based upon what he gets out of the situation oh he's nice and pretty when he sits down there and wants a little doggy treat you want a little doggy treat oh yes I'm the best dog in the world I'm so awesome I'm so amazing and you had no doggy treats like I could care less about you unless you're gonna pet me then I might be a little whatever but then to obey you without a doggy treat or something? No. no or if, or if, uh, conversely, if you, uh, if you scare your dogs enough, they will obey you because they fear you. But you see, they don't necessarily. Uh, who knows if they love you or not? I, I'm not going to get into the whole situation of how much your dog loves you and all these, these situations. But the fact remains is that they do things based upon what they're going to get out of it. And remember, they for envy offered up Jesus Christ unto the cross. They for envy did all these things. Uh, but the dogs basically, in a sense, they don't hear the word of the Lord because they've cut themselves off from the Spirit. They, they don't want to hear the Spirit. They've rejected the Spirit. And therefore, they go to the desires of their own flesh. And so this is quite literally uh, dogs or those people who have not only don't have the Spirit of God in them, they cut themselves and remove them uh, willingly away from the Spirit so that when the Spirit speaks to them, they cannot hear the words of the Spirit. And so quite literally saying, the dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, they pierce my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones, they, they look and stare upon me. So even quoting the, that uh, G, uh, in, in the book of John, uh, it says that, uh, that all his hands and feet were there. It was, I mean, all his bones were there, and none of his bones were broken. And, uh, and so he says, I can tell all my bones. John chapter 19, verse 31 through 37 says, None of his bones were broken, broken uh, and, and, and so forth. And so. And also, they part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. We see that quoted in John chapter 19, verse 23 through 24, how the Roman soldiers cast lots. So we understand and realize that even though uh, we can make the case that the Jewish generation of vipers and, and priests uh, were the ones who put Jesus Christ on the cross, how this reads out, it shows that not only did were they part of that generation, the Jewish vipers uh, of Israel were part of that generation of the leaders, but also the Roman soldiers are the same they that put them on the cross. 
And so we can see the link there that not only was it the Jewish generation of vipers and, and evil leaders that did it, so too were complicit in this uh, were the Roman soldiers. And the difference between the two is that the, the dogs, they can pass them about, they wag their heads and they insult and stuff. And the Roman soldiers are complicit in this that they don't live after the spirit. They just live after their flesh as well. They're the same type. Even though they're not part of the same nation, they are the same generation of the devil. They are still of that same generation. Uh, they part my garments. The dogs have compassed me about, just like those evil, wicked rulers. And then they part my garments, just like the Roman soldiers. But be thou not far from me, O Lord, O my strength. Haste thee to help me. So he's realizing his situation. He's realizing that he's, uh, he's into the dust of death. Quite literally, Jesus Christ uh, went to the grave. Quite literally, he went to hell. He quite literally went to the place of death. But fortunately, we know, of course, the end of the story that he didn't stay there. He didn't stay dead. He didn't go to death. He quite literally rose again, and, he, and death and hell could not keep him. And he rose again, taking the captivity. Those who believed in him and were stuck in that place, he took them with them, in, in fact. And so uh, the sting of death turned into victory. That's an awesome thing. But, but continuing on in this passage, deliver my soul from the sword, my darling from the power of the dog. He, he's desiring to, uh, to be saved. He's desiring for his soul. Uh, his soul, he calls it a darling. It, it's, a, it's that wonderful, nice thing that God has made, uh, created in him and so forth. You know, with, with the combination of the flesh and the spirit creates that soul. Uh, and he desire, and, and just as he calls it his darling, just as we, kind of how we want to live. Uh, we don't want to die. We want, life, we want to keep that precious life. It's a darling thing. It's a, it's a wonderful thing to have. I don't want to lose it. Either, and, and then I will, de and then save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard from the horns of the unicorns. Now, obviously, unicorns here. I just throw this in. Unicorns here is not talking about little, uh, little animal, you know, horse-like animals with a horn in their head uh, that that. Uh, flies on rainbows and, and, and twinkly glitter and all this stuff. No, that is not what he's talking about here. He's talking about a unicorn, uh, which is a uh, rhinoceros. You know, uh, 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 an, uh, the rhinoceros, which has a horn, in, uh, one, horn, one main horn in the center of his head, and then a small one as well, and then there's other ones that just have one horn. That's what he's talking about, the unicorns. Uh, just as he's talking about the bulls of Bashan with their horns, are shredding him about. He refers also to again to the rhinoceros, which it has that large horn that can pierce him. Uh, it pierced my hands and my feet. It, it there, it's he's talking about piercing things. The horns uh, of Bash, the bulls of Bashan horns can pierce him. Uh, the rhinoceros horn can pierce him. Uh, these horns have pierced my hands and my feet, uh, and and yet, Lord, I will declare Thy name. Unto my brethren, in the midst of my uh, of the congregation, will I praise thee? You see, even though he was on that cross, even though he felt forsaken, he still continued to do the work of the Lord. He continued to praise the Lord. Even when we're going through trials and situations, we don't know what's going on. We should not let what we don't know keep us from doing the things that we do know. Uh, just as just as. God and David and Job and, and everybody that's gone through tribulation in all past history, they weren't sure what was going to happen in the moment and yet they still declared the name of the Lord. They still declared through the process even when they felt that God has forsaken them, they knew see, this is the, the, the difference between a feeling and a knowing. Sometimes we can feel forsaken by God but when we trust in the things that God has done for those in the Bible those in the past, those other Christians, and we can trust that God has saved our soul from hell, and, and that He has quite literally made us His child from, from birth, that we can trust in these things, and even though we feel something, we can know a different thing. <coughs> and, and we can trust in God's Word that even though we feel forsaken, God has not forsaken us. Even though we feel that we can cry out, and indeed in our prayers we can cry out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? We can know that God is in us reconciling the world to himself. 
See, just whenever, uh, when we feel that we don't have the power of God, we feel that we've been mocked by the world, we too can say God is in us reconciling the world to himself. So, so it, while we don't know what's going on, continue to praise the Lord. Continue to do the things that God has called you to do, even in the time when you feel rejected. Even in the time when you feel that depression coming on, that feeling like you're all alone, rely on the things that God has already done for you. Rely on the things that God has already done for those in the past. Rely on those things that you know to be true so that you can endure the affliction that are but for a moment. I will declare thy name. You see, he right at this time, verse 22, he doesn't know what's going to happen to him. He's not sure why he's in this situation. Uh, well, I, I believe Jesus Christ does, but, but in the sense of feeling, in the fence, it, Jesus Christ in knowledge knows what's going to happen, knows what he's going through. Same way we too, that while we feel one way, we can know another. So that's what's going on in Jesus' mind here. He feels one way, but he knows another. See, uh, verse 22 is kind of like that, that switching over. You know how the Psalms oftentimes start one situation and then end in another? Verse 22 is where it switches over from feelings to his knowledge. Because we, even though we start from feelings and we cry out from feelings, which we shouldn't, we shouldn't deny those feelings, we shouldn't reject those feelings, but we should use them. And then in the process of time, our knowledge kind of goes over that and, and then helps control those feelings, helps us understand what's going on in our situation so that even though we feel this way, we can take comfort in knowledge of that these things won't be this way forever. I will continue. I will declare thy name to the brethren in the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. Even though I'm going through this trial, I don't know what's going on, I'll continue to praise him. Ye that fear the Lord, praise him. See, that's what he's doing here. Ye that fear the Lord. Not only is he comforting himself, he's also comforting others, even though he's going through this trial. How oftentimes have you seen Christians that are going through some sort of hard trial? You don't know if they're going to live or they're going to die. They're going to uh, li become healthy again or they're going to live some uh, long, drawn-out, painful life. They continue to praise the Lord in their situation, even though they don't know what's happening. That's what he's saying here. Ye that fear the Lord, praise him. So even if you don't know what's going on, if you fear the Lord, praise him. All ye seed of Jacob, glorify him and fear him. All the seed of Israel. See, uh, what I like about here is that now he's going into being a witness again. You know, those children of Jacob that are thrust upon God from the womb, he's encouraging them to have faith in God. He's encouraging them to not just rely on the fact that you're part of Jacob, but the fact that you are not only the seed of Jacob, but you're also the seed of, that if you have faith, you'll be the seed of Israel, uh, believing Jacob. Uh, I will declare my name unto the brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. He's going, to, he's going to continue to go to church. He's going to continue to go to these places if he can. He's going to continue even on the cross to be a witness to the church, to those who are faithful in the Lord. Ye that fear the Lord, praise him, all the seed of Jacob, glorify him, and fear him, all ye the seed of Israel. For he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither hath he hid his face from him, but when he cried unto him, he heard. See, verse 24 is the answer to Psalm 22, uh, verse 1. When God cries out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? When Jesus cries that out, uh, he's also keeping in mind verse 24 and onward that even though he feels this way he knows he hath not been despised nor abhorred. He knows that even in his affliction of the afflicted, in his own affliction uh, God hath not hid his face from him but when he cried unto him he heard My praises shall be, be, be of thee in the great congregation I will pay my vows before him that fear him. Now the great congregation is basically in heaven around God's throne uh, that great congregation the church of the redeemed the the uh, the, the that uh, that passage there when we're all together once again uh, in in that great congregation not just the in the midst of the congregation my local church my local uh, nation uh, my local this or whatever he's talking about that great congregation even though my body this worms destroyed yet will I see God says Job 
So to here, Jesus is saying, even though my body is going to be shed and it's going to die uh, and, and I'm going to go to the grave, yet I'm going to declare his name in heaven. I'm going to declare his name among the great congregation. This is the way we should have, even though we're going through life-threatening situations as Christians, even though, uh, just like the, when they were in Rome and they were being crucified for their faith, uh, they were able to say, I'm going to still praise God in this congregation on earth and also in the congregation, the great congregation in heaven. See, even though the, the, the body dies and is destroyed, we can still continue to praise the Lord because He's taking care of the situation. Even in our death, we can realize that, yes, God is working in us to reconcile the world to Himself even in our death. Even in the death of Jesus, we are reconciled to the Lord. My praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. I will pay my vows before them that fear him. If you fear the Lord, Jesus is going to pay his vows before the Lord for you. Uh, the meek shall eat and be satisfied. Because of what he did, because of what trial he went through, and so too we can apply to our own selves because of the trials that we go through, even though we don't know what's going to happen. Because of what we went through, the meek shall eat and be satisfied. We're going to be bringing people to the Lord through our situation. Even though we're pr praising the Lord through our trials, uh, the, the, the dogs are mocking at us and insulting us, saying, uh, He delivered others, let Him deliver Himself, and, and making all these mock at, mock at us. We see that through our situation, those meek, those humble, those who are not dogs, those who are not uh, rejected of God, those people that are humble and seek the Lord, they're going to be satisfied. They're, they're going to survive. You see, uh, because, Jesus, because of what Jesus went through, all those people that looked in faith, not having received the promises as of yet, looked in faith to the coming of Jesus Christ and their body being in the grave and they being in, in reserve, uh, waiting for the redemption of their spirit and soul in hell, they waiting there, sees Jesus Christ coming down to them, down into the earth, and they're like, our faith is not in vain. See, if Christ never went there, what would be of these people? If Christ be not risen, if Christ be not dead, if Christ did not go to the, uh, did not die and was buried and then rose again, where would they be? Where would we be? And where would the future generations be? You see, he had to go through this for us. So too that we go through our trials for other people, that the coming generations, those who we can witness to through the Spirit of God. The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek Him. Your heart shall live forever. You see, the reason why we're going through these trials is so that those who are seeking God can find Him. The reason why we continue to praise the Lord even in our trials is because when we speak truth in life, those who are seeking Jesus, those who are seeking God, seeking eternal life, they can hear the gospel through our mouths and receive through, that, through those words the Holy Ghost. And so that's what he's saying here is the meek, because of what I went through, even though I don't know what's going on in my life and I feel rejected, they're going to, uh, they're going to be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord and seek Him. Your heart shall live forever. You're going to live forever. So, so don't worry about the physical body. You're going to live forever. You don't worry about things you don't know about. Uh, trust in the things that you do know and continue to praise the Lord because you're going to see a lot of salvations from it. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord, and all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before the sea. Even though he feels rejected, and, and he's quoting, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He is keeping in memory, not just the first part of this, the way he feels, but he's keeping in memory, verse 24 on down, of what's going to happen because of what he's going through. This is the knowledge part. God, Jesus Christ knows this, while well, he's on the cross. My praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord. See, even in Psalm chapter 22, it knows that it's not just Israel who's going to be saved. It's going to be the whole world through his death on the cross that shall be reconciled to the Lord. All of the kindreds of the, of the nations. Does it say just some of the kindreds? Does it say just a certain amount? No, it says all the world. It says all the nations shall worship before thee. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he is the governor among the nations. So this verse, this passage, not saying, oh, only Israel, only the only a certain group of people are going to be able to partake in this. 
Now he says, The Lord is the governor among the nations. All they that be fat upon the earth shall eat and worship. All they that go down to the dust shall bow before him. Now, so even if you reject the salvation of Jesus Christ, you're going to bow before him. Every knee shall bow, the Bible says. And, and so we need to understand that even though we may, uh, we may reject the salvation that is free to all men, that saved the whole world, that, that <coughs> reconciled the whole world to God, even if we reject that as, a, as an individual, we're still going to bow. We're still going to submit to Jesus because of what he did on the cross. He says here, the du and, and, and they that go down to the dust shall bow before him, and none can keep alive his own soul. He's saying, they can't keep their soul alive, but I can keep it alive. They're going to bow before me. Huh? They're going to be through me. You see, even, even because the soul that is in hell, that it has that second death, you know, the reason why it lives eternally in hell is because Jesus Christ gave life to all people. The reason why that, that soul can't die is because Jesus Christ lied upon every man that cometh into the world. And if they reject that salvation, they cannot be with God in heaven, but they will endure the, the flames of wrath for eternity because everlasting life, the, if you understand this thing, everlasting life is given to the dead as well as the living through, through the blood of Jesus Christ. And, and so that is in addition to uh, accepting Christ and going to heaven and rejecting Christ and going to hell, eternally bowing before the Lord in his wrath. But they that be, uh, and the seed, verse 30, a seed shall serve him, it shall be counted to the Lord for generation. You see, Psalm chapter 22 gives us this realization. And when you, when you understand that there are two generations in this world, the generation of the devil and the generation, you know, obviously there's the seed of the flesh, which is uh, the first birth, that everybody is born of the flesh. But there's a spiritual seed of the devil, and there's a spiritual seed of Jesus Christ. And when the Bible talks about this, especially in Matthew chapter 23, 24, 25, when it talks about generations, it's not talking about the physical first seed, the, the physical generation uh, of Adam, but it's talking about that spiritual generation. You'll either be a generation of the devil, the dogs, or you'll be a generation, the vipers, the dogs, the that evil generation that all the, all the blood of righteous Abel and all the blood of the prophets will be, uh, will be requited upon, or you'll be part of that generation in Jesus Christ who uh, received that wrath who because of him receiving that wrath, you will not receive the wrath of that blood that was requited upon the evil generation. You'll be counted as a new generation, a different generation. This is what Psalm, see, understand that, that the New Testament, this is fully revealed, but the Psalms is where the foundation of this doctrine of, of a new generation, a spiritual seed is coming from. It's not coming from just some random idea that some guy had in the New Testament. It's coming from the Old Testament. And, and, it's, and, and so even though that the, the Pharisees and the Jews today claim, oh, this salvation is, is a new manufactured thing, we can see in the Old Testament that it's new, it, it, that it's always been taught. This is what God has always proclaimed. That the whole world, not just the Jews, not just Israel, but the whole world will be reconciled to God. A seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. See, God doesn't have great-grandchildren. He only has one he, he only has children. You know, he, he has a generation. He has a seed that, that is in Jesus Christ. When the Bible says that, that we cannot sin because we, he, keep, he keepeth the seed in him. He is within him. Uh, our spirit is in him. So regardless of what our body does, that generation spiritually uh, will be counted to the Lord for a generation. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born. See, today, well, what are we doing? We are declaring the generation of Jesus Christ. We are declaring the body of Jesus Christ. That is what we are doing today in this generation. Uh, we are counted a spiritual generation, a holy nation unto the Lord, the body of Jesus Christ. And ever since he died on the cross, we've been around declaring righteousness unto a people that are to be born. 2,000 years we've been adding to this generation through our faithfulness, through declaring His name in the congregation, through uh, going through trials, not knowing the end of a thing, we are declaring the generation Jesus Christ. And because of what we're going through, even though we feel like we're rejected of God sometimes, even though we feel like we're being abandoned, 
we continue to rely on the on the faith of those who that generation that came before us that we are part of and continue to rely on what Jesus Christ did on the cross continue to rely on what Jesus Christ did and God did through making us his child and we continue to praise the name of the Lord and through that process all knees shall bow one day and through that process this generation that shall be born will declare his name as well and become part of that generation and it says that he hath done this see when when Jesus Christ is on the cross the first thing he says my God my God why hast thou forsaken me and he goes through the process and then at the end after he gave his life what does he say it is finished it is done see he even the the part where he says it is finished is from Psalm 22 where he says he hath done this it is done he hath done it uh, that is what he's saying here in this passage he hath done this see what did Jesus Christ do even though he felt rejected even though he felt despised by God on that cross because of our sin he hath reconciled the world to himself you see the reconciliation is done now the question is will you receive will you live eternally in heaven accepting Jesus Christ being accounted as a generation or will you reject that free salvation and live eternally in hell suffering the wrath of God for eternity that fires of, of, of rejection of God see this is what he's saying here is that he had done this and then on the cross when he declares it is finished he's finishing up the psalm he had done this and so when he's speaking on that cross he wants us not to just think well maybe he thinks that God has forsaken him he wants us to understand Psalm 22 that he is fulfilling this prophecy and this prophecy cannot just be applied to David because it's hard to see how these things can apply to the life of David maybe he felt forsaken occasionally by God but everything listed in this passage you're, you'll be hard pressed to find it in the life of David but it's not very hard whatsoever to find it in the life of Jesus Christ and in fact he, he quoting the first of these verse, the, the first line of this verse uh, of Psalm 22, "My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me?" is claiming this verse to be applying to himself. And, and so, what he did on the cross was reconcile the world to himself, and, and now we are that generation declaring his name in the congregation. So, Psalm 22 is an awesome psalm. It is one of the clearest and most understandable ways that. God uses the Old Testament Psalms to allude to Jesus Christ and in fact we we understand and learn how God used the Old Testament prophetically to speak of what happens in the New Testament so we need to always trust and rely on that even if we don't understand something in the New Testament we can understand it's based in the Old Testament and we can understand what is happening in the mind of Christ by going to Psalm 22 that happened thousands of years before he ever endured pain on the cross and yet we know exactly what was going on in the mind of Jesus Christ on that cross it's pretty amazing the Bible let's pray dear Heavenly Father thank the blessed of your book thank you for uh, even though that the Bible is written over many thousands of years the things that happened in the very beginning are true all the way to the end of Revelation and it, it's one whole book those things that are written in the New Testament it's almost as if those things written in the New Testament about the Son of God and, and all these things that the Old Testament believer it, it seems almost as if they knew exactly what was written and, and how it was written why because they trusted in you and they didn't even though they didn't know when they were perhaps when they were writing down the psalm or, or the, the, the prophecy that they didn't know how it would be exactly fulfilled but they knew that it was about you and, and Lord I want to thank you for this book that is a collective whole that we can look in the Old Testament to understand the New Testament and that we can look in the New Testament to understand the Old Testament and that through it all you, you reveal things through your Holy Spirit that you've given to us Lord help us to be faithful servants even though that we may not know and understand the trial that we go through we can trust and rely on the things that you have done for us in Jesus name I pray Amen <laughs>